Why, hello, ladies and gentlemen. On today's show, it finally happened. It finally happened. No, not the James Harden Ben Simmons trade, which happened just as I was setting to record this, but the Universal DH is coming to a National League near you. That's right. The great debate is now over. It is coming officially, according to Rob Manfred, who gave a presser. Going to be talking about that, what it means, how I felt about the Universal DH uh, debate in the first place, how it impacts the Padres going forward, and how it might affect their free agency kind of market and what have you. And then, as a little bit of a treat, talking about my latest article, which is about fictional baseball players, just for a little bit of a treat for you guys. You know what it is. Locked on Padres. Here we go. <laughs> You are Locked On Padres, your daily San Diego Padres podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of Locked On Padres podcast, which is part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day for Thursday, February 10th. As always, I am your host with sometimes, occasionally, but certainly not always the most, Javier Reyes. You might be familiar with some of my baseball-related work at places like Baseball FYI, Fridays on Base, Off Bench Baseball, or Just Baseball, to which I am a staff writer for. Follow me on Twitter at Javapeno, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O, or if you want more exclusively Padres content, at L-O underscore Padres for the show. As always, thank you for making Lockdown Padres your hashtag first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms. And on today's episode, we got a nice juicy one for you guys. This is going to be a really, really fun one. I was thinking of saving this for Friday, actually, and make it like a little, a fun Friday podcast. You know what I'm saying? A fun Friday? I think that could be really cool. But instead, decide to react to the news that the National League is getting itself the designated hitter. That's right. It finally happened, according to Rob Manfred. That came out, so going to be talking about that, talking about how I've always felt about the universal DH sort of debate, going to be giving my thoughts on that, and then doing a little bit of a, a breakdown of how this affects the Padres going forward, because it absolutely does. And then lastly, talking about my latest article on fictional baseball play not, I'm crazy, and I deserve to have my craziness uh, broadcasted to the world and my deranged love of pop culture and whatnot. So guys, let's get into it. As I said, if I keep, you know, if I keep looking down at my phone, by the way, throughout this podcast. Uh, one of the reasons for that is because the James Harden and Ben Simmons trade just happened, and it's pretty nuts. My phone is blowing up. My Twitter is blowing up. Uh, so just just keep that in mind for all my viewers, uh, for all my watchers, I guess you could say. If you want to check out my ugly mug, by the way, Lockdown Padres on YouTube. Um, let's talk about it, guys. Universal DH, it has been a debate in baseball circles for a long time, uh, I'd say. And what happens is I think that there's two things with this, right? There's one just whether it makes sense to watch pitchers that are batting, right? That's the one aspect of it. And the second aspect is how much more fun adding the DH makes the league. The first point, let's talk about that for a second, right? A lot of people like to point out um, some old, older fans, right? That they enjoy the variety and having a pitch one to say, you know, who's your favorite pitcher? You just want to see him go up there and take a few swings because it is kind of fun. All right. I get that. And they say, if you don't like that, then you have American League Baseball. That's true, but the problem is that that's for people who are nomad types, right? Those are for people who don't have a favorite team that think that way, right? Where they're like, I just want the variety. Well, if you're a Padres fan, your thing is I only see, most likely, because it's not like baseball is um, football or the NBA, where it's it's a lot more localized of a sport when you just kind of look at the numbers and whatnot. People don't necessarily know what's going on in the American League. You know what I'm saying? They might have an idea when it comes to the trade deadline, and they're like, oh, yeah, let's go trade for that shortstop who's available or whatever for, that I heard about from the Yankees or the, the, the Cleveland or whatever like that, right? That's true. But in most most capacity, it is a localized sport. So you look at it from that perspective, and the variety is cool, but then it's like, all right, let's break it down, though. Yes, we got the Bartolo Colon home run from a few years ago. That is, in my opinion, the apex of what was possible that we could get from the lack of a universal DH. It was so much fun seeing him knock that thing into really not all that far, but it was a home run. Seeing him run around the bases looking like he was going to just keel over because it was the most, like, uh, I guess, cardio workout he's done in a lot of ways in terms of running that he's done in probably his whole career in Bartolo Colon, especially considering how old he was, big, sexy, and all that, right? So that was a lot of fun, right? That was the peak of it. My issue is that, 
And SB Nation, if I'm not mistaken, did a little bit of a, a while ago that if you kind of look at literally what is the best overall pitching staff hitting wise in the history of baseball and the OPS collectively of their pitchers was something like 580, like 600, like just below 600. If you are hitting below an OPS of 600, if you're in that 500 range, you're probably not playing in Major League Baseball. You know what I mean? Like, you're probably not. You're probably in, like, double A or something like that. So keep that in mind. That's what we're campaigning so much for, at least in terms of who likes the lack of a DH. That's what they like riding for, right? And the way I view it is just, you know what's more fun? Watching Fran Mil Reyes hit firecrackers into deep center field. You know what's more fun? David Ortiz getting his career extended longer because of his incredible hitting ability right? And becoming one of the most feared players in baseball and eventually getting inducted to the Hall of Fame, which happened uh, rather recently. That's how I view it. And don't get me wrong, some people might be thinking, well, this is, uh, I, I remember, I don't know if someone had this point for me. I forgot who I said um, had this point for me a while ago, but they said, you know, like in the NBA, when there's someone who's a poor free throw shooter, the NBA doesn't just decide, well, we shouldn't have those guys go into the line anymore because they're such porous free throw shooters. They suit 30%. DeAndre Jordan, Shaquille O'Neal. The difference between that, right? Now, here's the thing. There's a huge difference, right? There's still a minus for only being a DH. There still is a minus because it means that you cannot give out value in the defense, in the outfield. They can only use you at the DH, right? That takes away from it if you're a DH only, right? If you want to swap around your lineup, let's say look at the Padres for a second. If they don't want their first baseman being as poor of a defender he is at first base, maybe they say, let's move him to, to DH. And then we'll give Cronenworth the day at first base, right? It allows you to move guys around. Maybe it's like a, maybe not a full day off, but it's a little bit of a day off for guys playing the field, a little bit less of an injury risk. It's possible, right? So that's a one way to look at it. So you don't have that if you're only a DH. And then if you look at, at it on the another side of things, you say Fernando Tatis Jr., how happy would we have been last year instead of with that shoulder injury? What if he only had to play DH for a little bit? That could have been fun. Give him a break from shortstop. That could be really cool. The second aspect of all this, guys, is that I think is one that people don't talk about enough. And that's that the trade deadline and all of roster construction becomes infinitely more fun and strategic when you have the DH. And why is that? Well, let's look at the deadline last year. Nelson Cruz, right? One of the most sought after kind of players because Minnesota was really bad. He's older, can only play DH. Half the teams in the league can't even go for him. The Padres were so obsessed with him that they were willing to start trying him out at second base or whatever, right? Like that's how off they were. Like that's how much they were wanting to have his bat in the lineup. So my thing is the trade deadline becomes a lot more fun. Who gets Anthony Rizzo? Who gets Kyle Schwarber? All these type of players who you're willing to stick at the DH spot because it's not like they're doing too much for you defensively. Not that they can't do defense, but they're not doing as much for you, right? So there's a lot of strategy to that, and it just makes it a lot more fun, man. You know how much more fun the DH adds to the trade deadline and acquisition and stuff? It adds a whole lot. So that's my kind of view. Bartolo Colon was the apex of what we would ever see from pitchers that were hitting. Jacob deGrom, a close second when it came to that uh, that stretch when, uh, of this past season when he was, he was using one for all, going 100%, when he literally drove more runs in than allowed runs for like the first month and a half of the season. It was just absolutely incredible. Shout out Jacob deGrom. He might be the only one that's upset about this. He's like, God damn it, I'm the only one who gives myself run support anyway, and now I can't anymore. So maybe he's the only one upset about this truly and deservedly upset about this. Um, but guys, before we talk about the sec that second part that I was talking about, which is roster construction, what this could mean for the Padres going forward, let me talk to you about something that there is no debate on right? You're not going to have the old heads debating this one, right? They're not going to take the side of lack of universal DH, right? They're going to be with you on this. You know what that is? The best protein bars in all the lands, my friends. Talking about built Bars, ladies and gentlemen. They are phenomenal. They are great. This is the time of the year that I've pretty much given up on all of my New Year's resolutions, but not this year. You know why? Because I want to stick to my resolution to eat right. If you're watching the YouTube, you probably see me. I'm a little bit of a chunky boy, so I'm working on that. And But you know what's really helped a lot? Built Bars, right? Whenever I get that sweet tooth, they're really, really helpful for that because they are healthy for you. They are good for you. They give you everything, and they taste oh so good. But on that first point, when it comes to the macros, let's break it down. Most Built Bars contain 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, 4 net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. Compare that to a candy bar, which usually has around 240 calories, 30 grams of sugar, and dozens of net carbs. 
And you're you're golden. You're doing a whole lot better, man. Built bars are here for you, man. And what I love about them the most, they're here for you, man. You know what I mean? Uh, what I love about them the most, though, is they have such a great variety of flavors. Kind of like the Ben and Jerry's of protein bars, if you don't mind me saying, right? Mint brownie, coconut, coconut almond. And new for this month, white chocolate cookies and cream. They've got raspberry. They've got cherry barcia, apple almond crisp, which is my personal favorite. Coconut brownie chunk. And they've got all sorts. of. they got an eggnog flavor, a gingerbread flavor, like... They have all sorts of new flavors coming up all the time. By the time I finish reading this for you, by the time I finish doing this podcast for you, they might have a new uh, flavor that gets announced. That's what I love about them, guys. And because you're listening to this podcast, you can go to Built.com and use promo code LOCKED15 and you'll get 15% off your order. Remember, that's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. And also, guys, you know what week it is. We're a few days away from the Super Bowl. It's Super Week, brought to you by Get Upside, and there's no better place to get coverage of the big game than the Locked On NFL podcast. Locked On Bengals and Locked On Rams are in L.A. all week covering the big game, so be sure to go check those out. As I'm getting more and more messages and notifications about this James Harden trade, good Lord. Uh, maybe I wonder if this is going to hurt me in fantasy basketball. I hope that Seth Curry still has like a little bit of a role for the Nets. I also have Kyrie, by the way, which is just like torture. I tried to trade him, but I couldn't. But he gives me some value. But anyway, moving on, guys. Let's talk about baseball. That's what we're here to talk about, guys. I want to talk about how this DH could affect the Padres going forward, right? And I think that the biggest thing is, well, I already kind of mentioned the biggest thing, which is that it allows for a more variety of roster construction. But, and there's a big but. Let's talk about what this means for the Padres' first baseman. Because in theory, I was just mentioning before kind of breaking down. If you can only play DH and whatnot, and you're a little bit too much of a negative in the outfield, that affects how you can move the rest of the team. The Padres have quite a few negative defenders that I wouldn't mind giving the semi-day off treatment or what have you, and putting them at the DH spot. You know, your people like your Will Myers, the Padres first baseman, or maybe even someone like Tatis who has the shoulder injury, maybe give him a, a half day off, right? Because of that injury, maybe is it good to not have him there because you have good replacements, right? You have um, Hassan Kim, who's at least a really good defensive player. You can move Jake Cronenworth there. Maybe you can move um, Jake Cronenworth to first. There's a lot more roster flexibility, but bottom line is this, it does add another dimension to the fact of a certain player that a lot of Padres fans have been asking for, right? I think with the exception of Matt Olson, this is the number one guy, as we talked about a few weeks ago, that Padres fans want when it comes to the batting department, and that is Nick Castellanos, right? Here's the thing. Nick Castellanos, an enormously effective hitter. Enormously effective. But if you go by outs above average, and if you go especially by defensive run saved, since like 2018, he ranks dead last in Major League Baseball. He is without a doubt, maybe with a little bit of doubt. You could argue that there's maybe some other players, but he is basically among notable players. You know what I mean? Maybe there's like some, some no offense, some bench player out there that isn't as good that I'm not necessarily aware of. But among the notable players, especially among the players available in free agency, he is by far the worst defensive player that is like in Major League Baseball right now. He is that, that bad. The only one that could be worse is like if you put a player like maybe Jorge Alfaro, maybe Jorge Alfaro is pretty bad, who of course the Pioneers decide to acquire. Um, He's pretty bad, but part of that is because they're putting him in left field and he's a catcher. So it's kind of like, why are you doing that? So, but really for the most part, Nick Cassianos is bad. With the DH though, that adds a whole lot more value because he can, in theory, not hurt you nearly as much in the outfield if you put him at DH. But even still, with all the issues that the Padres have with the outfield, right? With all the issues that they have with the fact that Grisham is basically the only plus defender that they have. They do not have a lot of depth there. Jerkson Profar is okay every now and then when you need him to be. But Grisham, Will Myers, and then Tommy Pham was such a minus last year. I don't know if they re-signed him, but that's the thing, man. That's the thing. Can Does this make sense for the Padres to go get another minus defender, even if you still can't put him at the DH slot? I'm not really sure. But then again, you look at some of the other players available out there, it's not like there's that many other players that necessarily make sense for the Padres. Chris Bryant just retired. I'm sorry. Kyle Seeger. Look, it's been Kyle Seeger retired. You want to put him at the DH for like, you'd get him for like, maybe like, a million, but no, he retired, right? You have Chris Bryant, who can play a little bit all over the field. He can play left. He can play third. Certainly could do to work with the DH, but I think he's going to cost quite a lot of money, right? And you look at all the other guys that are available. I mean, 
it does Hansel Alberto sound appealing to you? Jonathan Villar? Uh, what else we got here? In terms of like Runed Odor, nope. He signed a one-year deal with Baltimore. Jordy, Mer- Jordy Mercer. Uh, oh, my God. Apparently, Ben Sim. Oh, my God. Joella Bede posted that picture of the dude who's happy at the funeral. Oh, my God. I just... Guys, I'm sorry. I'm just losing my mind a little bit. But um, to keep it going, you got Anthony Rizzo out there, a Brad Miller who can play a little bit across the infield. He's good defensively. But I'm just looking at players that might make sense, right? And really what I see here is Nick Castellanos is the best player. But with that minus defensively, he had a 4.5 war last year. And that part of that is because of his bad defense. What can you... Are we sure it makes sense to spend that much money? I've been making this point all off season, But my thing is... I just think it's too much money for a guy who's a liability defensively. You're probably going to have to give him a six, seven year deal. It sounds like that's what he's going to get. That's the vibe I'm getting because of his amazing offensive potential. I think that that's what's going to happen. I don't think he's going to resign with Cincinnati, but I'm just saying, um, you know, I really do think I'm getting more notifications. It's so hard to stay focused. Um, I do think that uh, it doesn't make sense for the Padres to go that direction. Maybe. This is the counter that I do think is interesting. Nelson Cruz, 3.9 war last season. He is 41 years old and is exclusively a DH. Maybe, though, could he potentially work out at first base? I was seeing some rumblings. Dennis Lynn did a little bit of a column a while back um, talking about this. Someone asked the question, um, you know, whether or not uh, this would be, you know, a viable option for the Padres. And you look at it and you say, okay. On the one hand, Nelson Cruz has been amazing as a DH for years. That 3.9 war, he's basically delivered that and better for years, whether it was even with Seattle, whether it was with Baltimore, whether it was with um, Minnesota. He was elite, and everybody kept expecting him to fall off, and he never did. However, this past season, he had a 725 OPS when he was traded to the Rays. He did hit some home runs for them, so it made him you know, somewhat viable. And it's you know, 725 OPS isn't the worst in the world. Hey, Manny Machado had like a 770 or something like that his first year with the Padres. Like, okay, he could have just hit a rough patch, right, when you're getting traded to a new team. That sometimes happens. But it is fair to note, 41, and we saw a little bit of a slowdown potentially. Does it make sense for the Padres to invest in that? I think if you get him on a cheap deal, right, and you figure out that some days maybe you can maybe work him out at first base and he could be okay there, not the worst thing in the world. Maybe you put the current Padres first baseman at DH, and then you move Nelson Cruz there, and most days you probably keep uh, Nelson Cruz at DH unless they do something, right? There might be something else that happens. Again, we have to see if the Padres first baseman is traded because they tried reportedly to do it at the deadline, so it is possible that they're going to try to move heaven and earth to get find a suitor for him, attach a prospect like a Luis Campizano or a Robert Hassel or what have you, not C.J. Abrams, he's untouchable, um, try and move him elsewhere. Because it only makes sense if you got C.J. Abrams coming up, wouldn't you like using him in the infield? So the way I view it is Nelson Cruz, not a bad idea, not a bad idea. But for now, until my same theory that I've said for a while. Unless the Padres trade the first baseman who will never be named, right? They, I just don't think that uh, signing these big free agents to be a DH for you works out. I think if you could maybe get someone like a Michael Conforto for cheaper, uh, maybe. But I think every team is interested in him. A lot of people have talked about Seiya Suzuki. Everyone's interested in that guy too. I think when it comes to a low-cost thing, Nelson Cruz could work. However, one more time. If they get rid of their current first baseman who must not be named, then all of the options that I've previously mentioned and more, I mean, there's so many other guys here. Uh, Jorge Soler, maybe they might even bring in him. He won't cost much. Brett Gardner, one of my favorite players ever. They could bring him in. But bottom line is um, there's a lot more room to operate when it comes to free agents if they are able to move on from him. If not, I think one of the best case scenarios is a Nelson Cruz. It's worth it because I don't think he's going to cost nearly as much. So yeah, guys, that's what I think about the DH for now going forward and how it affects the Padres. But before we get into the last fun segment of today's podcast, you know, I imagine the odds just got thrown off all over the place with this Ben Simmons, James Harden trade. And oh my God, Joella Bede is going to the Twitter Hall of Fame, guys. Everybody, if you're watching this, I cannot believe he posted that. He is a legend. I can't wait to talk to my friends about this. This is going to be awesome. But when it comes to betting, this James Harden trade, it probably threw off the betting odds. And what have you. Who's going to win the title? Does this put Philly over the top with Joel Embiid, with James Harden, with Tyrese Maxey? Does that make them title favorites? I don't know. But Bet Online, they've got you covered this season with all the bets, props, odds, and 
lines more than ever before. But obviously, football continues its march through the playoffs right to the big game this Sunday. It remains the best spot for all of your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. And of course, not just football and basketball. They've got you covered with pro and college hoops. Not just pro, but also college hoops. That's right, guys. The NHL, boxing, UFC, whatever real-time updates of current games as well. Don't wait to take advantage of all the new amazing offers available for the 2022 season. Bet online where the game starts. Woo! Mm-mm-mm. All right, guys. One last fun little segment. We are talking about fictional baseball players now for the end of this over at Just Baseball, an article that I'm going to link in the description uh, for you guys to go check out. So I'm not going to read word for word what I wrote here, but I wrote about the five, un- my picks for the five underrated fictional baseball players ever. And there's a lot on here that you might be thinking, oh, let me guess, you're going to say, uh, you know, the people from Twilight. No. I don't think Edward from Twilight, that infamous uh, baseball scene where they're throwing the ball like 800 miles an hour, I don't think he's underrated because everyone knows about that scene. So I talked about a lot of them. And, you know, yes, this is peak content that you do when you're in a lockout. You know what I'm saying? Uh, And I'm probably going to talk more about fictional baseball stuff and baseball movies as time goes on. And we can see this lockout as I'm about to sneeze. (laughs) Woo! Sorry about that, folks. Um, It all of a sudden got really, really cold in the room that I'm recording in. Uh, so let's talk about it a little bit. I'm just going to talk about my five picks that I made. Again, you can go read the reasons why, um, Mickey Kayleen from Hey Arnold was one on there. Uh, Hey Arnold is a show that I wish that I had watched, um, growing up, but I didn't, (laughs) but I did it. I didn't get a chance to, uh, growing up. I was a lot more into some other anime stuff and I was more into, you know, kids next door and SpongeBob and some of those other shows, Danny Phantom, Samurai Jack, Avatar, last airbender. So I never really got to catch Hey Arnold, but it sounds like something that would be my vibe. And one of the episodes is about this fictional player, Mickey Kaling, who in the Hey Arnold universe is basically a legend. He's had all these home runs, incredible batting average and stuff. And this episode's basically about nostalgia. So he had to be included, right? Number two, uh, you guys know I love anime, and you knew I was going to find a way to sneak some anime on here. It is Gene from Samurai Champloo. Champloo would probably tell you how great that series is. It is some very big-time anti-hero vibes, but one of them, Gene, there's actually a funny episode called Baseball Blues, which takes place at the end of the series, basically. It's the last episode before a three-part series finale. Uh, And the series, by the way, not long. Only 26 episodes, so go check that out. It's by the person who did Cowboy Bebop, if people are familiar with that. But uh, it's basically a mockumentary kind of revisionist history on the origins of baseball in Japan, where the main characters face off against these American travelers who are obnoxious and just ugly. You know, the ugly American, right? And it's really, really funny. And one of the the guys, he's a samurai, he swings the bat like he's a samurai. Like he holds it down, uh, down to below his belt and whatnot, and then still managed to hit home runs and stuff like that. So I talked about that um, in the article as well. So he's on here. Another one on here is Bart Simpson. And you know why? Because there's this incredible TikTok that you guys got to check out. Like, seriously, go check it out. It is incredible. Um, it's one of the funniest things I've seen. And it's basically just Bart hitting a home run and then doing like 800 celebrations uh, between the base taps. Diff- and different ones, by the way. Heading from first to second. Heading from second to third. Third to home. He does like a zombie one. It's it's just so funny. And they put some rap music in the background and it makes me laugh. And that's why he made it. Um, I wish more home runs were like that, by the way. I wish more home runs were guys just doing obscene celebrations every five seconds, uh, just as they walk the bases, you know, maybe they do a little bit of a, you know, firepower thing, like a Usain Bolt, you know what I'm saying? Like, just do a thumbs up to the fans, like, anything would be so much fun, and I know pitchers would get mad, but you know what? Strike them out, man. That's what you gotta do. Number four on my number five, uh, on my five uh, most underrated f- fictional baseball players, Bobby Rayburn, The Fan, a movie that I watched for the first time a few weeks ago uh, after I had finished recovering from my sickness and the my cold that I had a few weeks ago. Um, look, you got to look this movie up. It's not particularly good, but it is Wesley Snipes, John Leguizamo, and Rob De Niro. So, in my opinion, it's a must watch. Oh, it also... Um, What's his name? I'm blanking out his name right now. Benicio Del Toro, my Puerto Rican king. Uh, He's also in the movie. It's kind of just an insane movie about how this new player, Bobby Rayburn, comes to town, comes to the San Francisco Giants, and this fan is ready to do anything for him to succeed. And I mean anything. You like the movie The King of Comedy? You like Joker to an extent? 
you like psychological thrillers, but also some baseball fun stuff on the side and some nerdy baseball stuff, uh, check this movie out. But uh, it's not necessarily good. It might be a good bad Hall of Fame movie, but it is incredible. And at, at the least, De Niro's still good at it. It's Robert De Niro. What, what can he hit? Well, so is Wesley Snipes, by the way. But basically, in this, I don't want to spoil the movie. Uh, entirely for people who haven't, but he performs at the end of the movie arguably the most clutch feat ever for a fictional baseball player. Ever. Ever. And I discussed that in the article, guys. And now number five, the last one for the most underrated fictional players that I have is Kuro-sensei from another anime, um, Assassination Classroom. Easily, out of all the anime I've watched, I've watched a lot of the main ones, but this is a little bit of like that a little bit down the rabbit hole, a little bit. It's it's a popular one in the anime circle, but this is a little bit of a, a crazy one. It's basically about this E-class students, i.e. there's A, like the great students, and there's E-class. They're terrible, right? They're the, they're the nobodies. They're not going anywhere in life. Like, it's this breakfast club. You know what I'm saying? Like, they're, they're the losers. They're like the, what's his name from? Um, Judd Nelson from uh, uh, Breakfast Club. Like, that, that's what type these, these kids are. And they are tasked with assassinating their teacher who is an alien creature that is yellow and with a bunch of octopus arms. And if they don't assassinate their teacher, then the whole world gets destroyed. Mm -hmm. Yep. Welcome to anime, folks. Go check out that show. At least go check out... The problem with the show is I think it's... Samurai Shampoo is just straight up good. Assassination Crashtube is a little bit weird. Has a lot of bit of the anime tropes that people who don't watch anime probably are familiar with. It is a lot of fun at parts. And genuinely some unbelievably emotional moments at the end. It's only two seasons long, so it's not too long. But I admit, a little bit of a barrier to entry if you're not used to anime weirdness. You know what I'm saying? But the plot is crazy. And one thing that happens is a little bit of a side plot. Their sensei isn't, like, mean. He's just teaching them. He's just teaching them class. And he's trying to also teach them, you know, how can you better assassinate me and whatnot. Uh, and basically one of the things that ends up happening is the class gets challenged to a baseball match. And they have to practice. And this guy, Kuro-sensei, he can move at Mach 24. For the for context, I think the fastest jet ever moves at Mach 10 speed. <laughs> so basically, he's invincible, right? He's he's super fast and just can't be stopped, right? The only way, and that's the fun part about the show, is how can you assassinate someone like this? And he can basically play every position. He throws, he pitches 300 kilometers per hour, <laughs> and he can play every position and stuff. So that's a little bit of a sneaky one. But yeah, those are my five underrated picks for fictional baseball players. And I'm wondering, my task for you guys, send me anything on Twitter, uh, comment in the YouTube description, uh, whatever, on at LO underscore Padres, who you think are the most underrated players uh, in fictional baseball history. Uh, there's definitely a lot out there, some books that have been out there, right? Some other movies, but underrated. I'd like to know your pick. And I know what you might be thinking. Well, what about the best fictional baseball player ever? If I were doing a draft, you know who's number one? It's Benny the Jet Rodriguez. That's right. You know why it's him? Because not only was he good, not only did he literally make it to the pros, right? He's the most clutch. This dude, to help save a kid's confidence, told him to stand out in the middle of the field, holding his glove up in the air, and just said, stand there. And he had to hit the ball exactly to where the glove would be. That's clutch. Because if he messes up, that kid's confidence is destroyed. That's clutch, and he's a great leader. He's a great friend. On top of being a great baseball player, this man wins, and he knows how to rally people behind him. People follow him, and I want leadership out of my first overall pick. Roy Hobbs, whatever. Wild Thing, whatever. For Major League and The Natural, respectively, whatever. It's all about Benny the Jet Rodriguez, guys. So, yeah, hopefully you enjoyed this uh this fun little episode, guys, that about does it for today's episode. Before we kind of uh, officially wrap things up, though, let me just mention to you, before we talk about future episodes, Locked On Bets, really good podcast. Your daily one-stop shop for all your gambling needs, hosted by your boy Q with expert analysis and insight from Lee Sterling. It's free and available wherever you get your podcast. Go check that out. They've got some stuff for the Super Bowl. In terms of the future of this podcast... A lot of stuff. We're going to be talking about Trent Grisham next week, doing a breakdown of his whole season and how the Padres need him to bounce back. Have that coming for you in the future. And also, tomorrow's podcast, most importantly, going to be finally going over the Zips projections that Fangraphs did for every position all across the board for the 2022 Padres. Going to be breaking that down. Going to be talking with Lindsey Crosby of Locked On MLB Prospects about Mackenzie Gore. That's right, a Mackenzie Gore episode that's coming to you guys. And uh, just good vibes is also coming. Because while baseball is still in a lockout, I'm still trying my best to make you guys happy, guys. Hopefully, 
you enjoyed today's episode. That about does it for today's edition of the Lockdown Padres podcast, the only pod that may be better than the Padres themselves. Remember to subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcasts from. Follow me on Twitter. And until next time, stay safe and, of course, stay faithful. My fire faithful homies, take care.